This is Vanessa Marshall, voice of Black Canary, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Samwise Game G, D, 6, 1. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Samwise Game G. Samwise is the accessibility director for the tabletop RPG actual play Twitch channel Chromatic Chimera, as well as a member of the tabletop RPG actual play group No Initiative. You can hear them play in multiple actual play shows across the internet, including Quest the Soaring City over on No Initiative, Woven Realm on Chromatic Chimera, and as part of the incidentals on Protean City Comics. And outside of the tabletop gaming world, you can also hear their voice acting in other visual novel and audio drama projects. Sam, I am so excited to welcome you to Whelmed. I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. So before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including all three seasons of the show so far, the comics, the video game, and even the audio play. So if you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all of that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the intro, but could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, so my name is Sam. I go by Samwise Game G online. I use they them pronouns. As you mentioned, I'm a podcaster and a streamer of TTRPG actual plays, and I'm a voice actor. I am also disabled and chronically ill, and I am very, very loud about it. <laughs> and I am a non-binary, agender, and panromantic, asexual, and very loud about that too. So I'm very excited to get to talk about some queer disabled superheroes yeah. today. <laughs> I'm very excited to get into all of it with you. But before we do all of that, uh, our, our other general intro questions, just so we can get to know you a little better. When did you first see Young Justice? Were you one of the people who saw it on DVD or Netflix? Or did you watch it all the way back when it was originally on TV? Or are you somebody who's seen it more recently on DC Universe or HBO Max? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I caught, I think it was the first two seasons, like right after season two came out on Netflix. Um, and then I had to wait forever <laughs> to be able to see season three until I got access to HBO and could see it on there. So I only recently got to see season three at all, um, which was super exciting because it was my favorite one, I think. Um, it was a lot of fun. I really liked it. <laughs> and we all had that, that adventure of those, those many, many years between yeah, season two and waiting. season three. <laughs> it's that adventure there. Like, it's really interesting to me finding people who've like found the show recently. Cause I'm like, oh, you, you've never existed. You've never watched the show in a world <laughs> where there wasn't a season three for some people now. And I'm like, that's wild. Yeah, I remember I had finished season two and I was like, oh man, like, it's, when's more coming out? And I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> as I started looking into it more. Yes, but at least at least finding it on Netflix meant you had a little little less less long to wait than some people. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah, uh, I think it was only like two years or something. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what was your history with DC and comics in general before you saw Young Justice? If you had one. Uh, yeah, so I think probably my first exposure to DC that really stuck with me, at least, was when I was a kid and watching Batman the Animated Series growing up. Um, I didn't really have access to actual comic books. Um, like, you know, there like was one comic shop in my town and it was too far for me to walk and my parents didn't want to take me or spend money on comic books. <laughs> So, um, I do remember, like, reading about a lot of comic books on, like, old, like, GeoCities, like, fan sites people made and stuff, so, yeah, I was, like, vicariously reading a lot of them, but 
the cartoons were kind of like my real introduction um like between the animated series and like justice league and jlu and stuff and yeah all a very good gateway into into this adventure of superheroes they're really excellent so as we have said several times now you are a podcaster and an actor and both of us have been on protean city comics but We'd somehow never actually like interacted until really recently when one of uh, our lovely editors over here on Whelmed, uh, Richard Kreutz Landry, saw that you were live tweeting your first watch through of season three of Young Justice. And he just kind of pointed us in each other's direction was like, you two (laughs) need to talk. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Because you were having all of these really wonderful and enthusiastic uh, and thoughtful observations about the show. Uh, and especially about some of the aspects of representation on Young Justice that you mentioned earlier in your introduction that are so important to you uh, and very close to your heart. And we knew early on, we're like, well, that's what we're going to talk about because you were clearly just so hyped to talk talk about these things. So let's dive into all of that, all of these many (laughs) things. We're we're talking about a couple of different things this time around, but just because they're all they're all connected to you. They're all they and that's great. So where do you want to start? What character aspect do you want to start with of the many we could choose from? Oh, goodness. I know. I don't even know. Um, I feel like I'll probably have the most to sort of ramble on um, when we get to, like, the sort of disability and illness aspect of things. Like, where to start? Yeah. Where to start? (laughs) Where to start? Um, Let's start start with Halo, because she's first on my document here. Um, So Halo, (laughs) Halo has been such an important character for so many people and I know when she first showed up on this show I remember seeing and reading some of your tweets about this of being so excited about the scene where Halo talks about kind of her her journey with her own gender identity and like I'd love to hear your thoughts on that outside of a whatever many character tweet I'd love to hear more about that from you (laughs) sure um so with Halo, it was really exciting just to see anybody on screen actively question their gender identity like that. Yeah. Um, it was just really, really awesome to see her just come out and express it, you know, in this big group setting too. Like, you know, it was really wonderful to see the support of the team about it. I think one of my favorite moments is when Halo, you know, asks Brion if it's okay that she doesn't, you know, feel necessarily male or female. And the camera pans to Artemis, like, raising an eyebrow, like, she's going to totally kick Brion's butt (laughs) if he's, like, not totally into it. And I kind of, like, I love that shot and that implication of, like, Artemis is here for Halo and, like, you know, ready to go for her. And because it can, you know, it's scary to come out in any setting. And for someone like Halo 2, where she's sort of learning how to navigate existence at all. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you know, there's an entirely different layer of, I'm sure, fear and uncertainty there. And yeah, I, it was, it just felt really good. <laughs> and I know I I loved this scene when I first watched it, too, even though, like, it's one of those moments where we're, we're watching it. I remember thinking, like, this, this isn't for me, but this is going to be so important for someone. That kind of, that feeling. Right. Where, like, I'm like, the, I, like, I don't have that. For me, I am a cis woman, but like I was like, this is going to matter so much to someone and I am filled with joy over that feeling of that's going to matter so much to someone kind of thing. Oh, I was going to say, I was surprised um, by how much it hit me, actually, when I saw that, because I had had no idea, like nobody had spoiled it for me or anything, um, which was kind of really nice. Like people had been like, oh, wait until season three, you know, the (laughs) LGBT representation is, you know, really going to kick off, like you're going to love it. And I was watching it, and I just, I, like, honestly, I just started crying during that scene, and I did not expect to. Um, it was just incredibly cathartic. I have sort of been figuring out my own gender identity for, like, the past two years, um, sort of more openly and outwardly. And in that time, I've gotten to see some non-binary representation, you know, like we have some in she and Steven Universe, which is awesome, but none of it hit me the same way. We never got somebody questioning it or coming out about it. 
and have somebody sort of more humanoid to representing a non-gender conforming character is really awesome. Um, a lot of times it's, you know, aliens or like straight up robots. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. so you know i mean the mother box is an artificial intelligence but still a living sentient being and in a humanoid body so it's, you know it's as she put, it's, it's still really impactful <laughs> it's yeah it's complicated and it doesn't diminish how much it means to you know see that happen and have that like it's so good and i what two of my favorite things about that scene uh, that I have talked about on the show before when we covered this episode, but I love that the way that that scene goes when Halo says that, like, asks, is this OK? Is this an OK thing for me to feel? The yeah. first thing that happens is Miss Martian going, of course, it's OK. And having that yeah. character who has had her own journey and accepting herself in other complicated ways that are, of course, different from Halo's journey, but kind of accepting that the way she sees herself and the way the rest of the world sees herself are not necessarily the same. Um, right. And that kind of parallel, emotionally symbolic kind of connection between these two characters and having her be the one who steps up and immediately is like, yes, of course this is okay for you to question this or feel this way, whatever it may be. And I loved that. Uh <laughs> yeah. It was a really nice moment, yeah, for sure. It's a good character connection to have. And the other thing was that the way that scene starts, remember thinking and watching it and thinking that scene was going to go a different way because it's framed as someone, I forget which, uh, it's either Artemis or Miss Martian says so like, oh, it's going to be so nice to have uh, more girls on the team. Yeah. And Halo's first thing that she says, she's like, oh, more girls and my brain was like are we gonna do a plot line about how like she's uncomfortable with other girls interacting with Brion or something like that or I'm like are we gonna do something that's right. that tired teen storyline <laughs> that like my brain is hardwired to think is where stuff is going with teenagers only to have it shift into a much more meaningful and much more impactful take on what that means and what her what that question was about I'm like oh, this is wonderful and emotional. Oh, I don't know why I yeah. ever thought this show was going to go the wrong way. <laughs> it really, it was so reassuring. Um, and it's interesting because I'm trying to think back now and I'm like, did I have sort of that same moment of like concern? <laughs> and I think something in like her voice, which honestly also really lends itself to the skill of the voice actor, told me that, you know, like, I was like, oh, like, I recognize that, like, huh, girl, yeah, no, not so much, like, <laughs> you know, just sort of tone and inflection. Zara Fuzzle is such an amazing actress, and we have had her on in the past, and talking to her about this scene and about this aspect of Halo's character is so sweet, because she's talked about how back when, back when conventions were still happening, when we weren't in, uh, weren't yeah. in a pandemic... <laughs> Uh, she every now and then would have people who would kind of who would come up to her table and talk about like, I think I feel the way Halo does kind of thing. And that have it oh. how that was so meaningful to her of having people who felt comfortable to like say that to her because of this and all of that is wonderful. I love, that. I love it. This and this has been seeing everyone react to how that storyline has gone so far online has been so amazing i think there were articles when that when that episode first came out about how halo might be the first non-binary superhero in like dc television media and dc like dc and any of the dc animated right. stuff movies and television and all that and like having that realization of like oh this is the first time we're doing this okay yeah <laughs> it's, it's great it's wonderful oh, it's just it's it feels so good to know that, you know, other people are able to see themselves for the first time in Halo, yeah. you know? I mean, I had, I'd said it's only been like the last two years or so um, for myself, and you know, I'm 33, so that <laughs> means I didn't figure this very important part of myself out until my 30s, and 100% if, you know, I had had a character like Halo when I was you know, 13 and watching, you know, like Teen Titans and all of the other superhero things I had mentioned earlier, like, it it would have made a huge difference. Because, you know, like, there were things back then that I just wasn't able to piece together. And if I had had 
a rep like a bit of representation to sort of point me in that direction it would make such a difference and i'm so happy to know that you know that means there are other people who get to have that now and oh. <laughs> Branching off into some other stuff from season three, because season three across the board had a lot of wonderful LGBT plus representation for a lot of people. And one of those things was Calder and Wind, which was a wonderful, yes. like, like just surprise of the season that none of us had seen coming. That was just so, so sweet and so lovely to see on screen. They are so cute together. <laughs> they are. Uh, they're so sweet. And I... I, one of the things that I love about how the show handled this, because this, because Calder, of course, was initially created for Young Justice and then kind of spun off into the comics. And a lot of people have been pointing out for years now that Calder in the comics is gay and being like, is Young Justice, if we get a season three, is that going to be something that comes up? Is that ever going to be something that we're going to see? And the creators of Young Justice always being very spoilers, no comment type of people were would never talk about it. And then having this show up unexpectedly in season three was so wonderful. And even more wonderful from my perspective was that that very sweet moment with the two of them at the end of one episode. I'm forgetting the number and the name, but it's just Calder returning home and they kiss and you're like, oh, my God, this is great. Wonderful. This is a great yes. high point to end this episode on is followed by the next episode, us getting to actually see them being a power couple and fighting Yeah, on a together. mission together. Yeah, because I feel like other other shows might have just like shown us, Calder has a boyfriend, isn't that cute? And then gone, but Calder's not on the main team, so like we're not going to focus on this or show any more of this. We just want you to know that it's there mm -hmm. kind of thing. And the fact that Young Justice took the time and energy and space to go, one, we're telling you this is true. Two, we're going to show you what their relationship is actually like and make them even cuter than this one moment because they're yeah. adorable. <laughs> I love the just, you know, handful of like little quiet like moments and exchanges they have together. It's it's really sweet. And I love getting to see a, a queer couple like that, you know, on yeah. screen because we get to see like you know, McGann and Superboy have, like, their, like, sweet little moments, and even Wally and Artemis, so it's so nice to see just the equivalent <laughs> cute moments to yes. to the queer couples, because, you know, a lot of a lot of other properties don't, don't do that so much, yeah. so. <laughs> and just the really impactful thing of having two male superheroes who are just clearly happy and in love, like, yes, I feel like... they get to just be together. Yeah. I feel like superhero media, even as we have tended more towards doing doing better in superhero media and representation in superhero media, still like leans on the drama of stuff in, in certain things in a way that is not always productive, if that makes any sense. Like it's like sometimes yeah. you just want to see two people be happy together. Uh, and right. that is even more important for like marginalized voices to just be able to be happy together. Exactly. And so getting to see these two where it's just like, no, there is no drama between Calder and Wind. They are adorable. <laughs> they are going to punch evil in the face together. Uh, and then they're going to hold hands underwater. And I'm like, that's great. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> oh, I do. I really love them. Um, I hope I hope they have nothing but happiness <laughs> in the time between seasons. <laughs> and one of the things that like, Talking about all this for whatever reason, it keeps reminding me of like the stuff that happened online after certain episodes came out. And I remember when the episode that first introduced Wind came out, the creators of the show, uh, Greg and Brandon, did like this thing that I felt was really interesting and really helpful, which was just being aware that there were going to be questions and responses about this and being available on Twitter that morning when it came out to respond to things and oh, to wow. I and didn't know that. it was it was really it was really nice because I just remember my my like timeline on Twitter was full with a lot of people being like so is Calder gay is he bi is he what what we can we can we have some clarification just because that's the way people are people want to be able to put labels on things sometimes and they were very thoughtful mm -hmm. and in their responses to things and being like I if I'm remembering correctly what they said was we don't have a label for Calder, but only because we think Calder hasn't picked a label for himself yet, was their mm -hmm. understanding. And they're like, 
Calder loves wind. Calder loved Tula. And those are the two things Calder's sure of. <laughs> Beyond right. that, Calder's still figuring some things out. And I'm like, that's actually a really that. thoughtful and wonderful way to respond to this yeah. instead of being, instead of either not responding to anything or like rushing into trying to define something of just being like, the only reason we don't have a label is because Calder doesn't have one for himself yet. I'm like, that's actually really wonderful. Uh, yeah. And I mean, that even in itself is a really important aspect of like, representing you know the queer community is so many people are trying to figure ourselves out <laughs> so it's it's nice to see that too you know what i mean like yeah. it's equally awesome when we get a definitive this character is you know non-binary this character yeah, is yeah. pansexual this character is bisexual it's freaking awesome especially for the members of those communities because we are all deeply underserved, <laughs> underrepresented. Um, yes. So it's like I understand wanting to get that confirmation, but again, like having that awareness both of the characters positioning and you know, like just uh, sort of where they are at in their own development, um, and it still gives a voice and representation to an important part of the community to have that, like, I, I don't have a label because <laughs> I'm figuring it out. Maybe I won't ever have one and that's okay too. Like, I love that. I think that's great. Yeah. I, I just remember thinking, I was like, oh, that's really nice that you're it doing is. this. Speaking of other characters who may or may not have labels for their identities, this season also introduced Harper Rowe who I know is super important yes. to a lot of people uh, from the comics. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on her and just everything we get from her this season. Yeah, um, I'm honestly not familiar with Harper Rowe from the comics. So I get to sort of come at this just from the excitement of seeing this cool sort of, you know, punk... <laughs> cool punk person, um, you know, flirting with Halo where I'm like, hee hee hee. Because, <laughs> um, I don't know, my, my personal thing is I never thought Brion was good enough for Halo anyway. <laughs> so, that's, you know, whatever. As the season <laughs> turned out to prove, that's a valid view. <laughs> right? I was like, freaking called it. <laughs> what a butt. <laughs> um. So I, I of course, as, as as listeners know, I'm not super well versed in my comic book history, but I know because of hearing people talk about it after the season came out, mm -hmm. um, Harper in the comics is a superhero named I think named Bluebird, I think, uh, but I might not I might not be totally sure on that. So people were very excited. Some people were very excited to see her show up, and in the comics, she she is queer. I can't remember if she's. Uh, She's bi or gay, but she is queer in the comics. Uh, and so people were like, oh, is this going to be a thing? Are we going to see more of this? And we did. And people were very excited about that. That's awesome. And she's great. And the thing I am hopeful for for next season is I would, whether or not we ever see her as a superhero, I want to see, I'm trying to think of a more analytical way to say this, but really, I just want to see Harper be happy next season. Yes. But in the, in the more, in the, broader strokes version of that I think a lot of we we talked about it when episodes were coming out that a lot of what Harper was presented as initially was kind of all of these like very dark very like just bad behavior and bad choices and very self-destructive choices that initially watching it I was frustrated with because it felt like it was tying in her queer identity to those self-destructive choices initially mm -hmm. only for the show to very thoughtfully and wonderfully point out that all of her self-destructive choices were like the result of things outside of her control and trying to do the right thing and all of that which made up for those initial feelings we just had to wait a couple of weeks in between right. episodes for me to be like oh now I can go back and watch the season and be like oh this all makes sense but at the time <laughs> when a scene is like here are these two teenagers drinking, illegally shooting guns, uh, and also kissing. I'm like, well, that just ties in that to right. be part of those other self-destructive behaviors. Only for the show to then go, no, no, we're thinking this through. All of that is about Harper trying to protect her brother and get away from an abusive environment and all of that. I'm like, oh, good. Glad you're thinking all of this through. But because that's where all of that kind of started with this character in season three, I would love to get to see her and her identity, like give Harper Rowe a girlfriend of any kind yeah. somewhere in the world <laughs> that 
isn't tied in with all of that other uh, more self-destructive behavior so that I can just see Harper be happy. (laughs) Yeah. An interesting thing, too, though, is, like, I mean, it's obviously never good to, like, tie or link, you know, an identity into these, like, negative aspects. But when you have enough representation, you don't need to worry quite so much about, like overanalyzing how, you know, you approach some things. It's like, yeah, I can have an evil queer character when I've got, like, five totally awesome, you know, like, queer members on the team kicking butt and having happy, healthy relationships. (laughs) And, like, you know, that's... I love that the show has enough flexibility with its representation that they're able to not have to play into like tropes or necessarily like walk on eggshells trying to avoid some in some ways if that makes sense yeah no that totally makes sense and I think that's also one of those things where like as the season went on I felt less and less annoyed about that particular scene because like that all of that happened like before we saw wind and before we got a bunch of other Mm -hmm. things and like once those were added I was like oh in hindsight I can go back and like watch all of this and be like all of this makes sense and flows together and does not feel as rough as it did the fir- the first time watching these week to week and not having kind of yeah. the bigger scope of things, if that makes sense. I think, honestly, I'm sort of realizing right now that, like, the show has, es- at this point, to me at least, established itself as, like, comfortable and safe enough that I can actually relax while I watch it. And, like, I'm not as immediately on edge when I see, like, a character in a wheelchair or using crutches. Like, okay, what are they gonna... What are they gonna do to fix this person or something <laughs> like that? Yeah. Or, you know, if I see two, like, characters, like, kissing, I'm like, okay, who's gonna get fridged? <laughs> like, yeah. I... At first, you know, for sure, I'm like, oh, okay, well, like, where's this going? But after this season especially, I'm like... I can just sit back and the only anxiety I fear is, you know, the high angst (laughs) turmoil of comic book drama. And that's all I want. (laughs) That is that is such a compliment for a show, I feel like, in general, (laughs) like any media that I can think that about from like my own perspectives and my own things. I'm like, good, good, good. Yeah, right? It is definitely important to sort of reiterate that, like, all of, you know, these uh, feelings and stuff I'm having are 100% my own and, yeah. you know, coming from my own admittedly privileged experiences and, you know, lifetime. So, but for me, at least, it feels real good. <laughs> it's so nice. So one of the other things that you'd thrown out in all of in all of the stuff that we wanted to talk about today is <laughs> how the show deals with mental health, which I know we've talked about before in the past, but is so important and is so good. I I love I love how the show has handled things. And I've I've talked many a time about how much I love how the show handled things. So I would love to hear some of your thoughts on it, on how the show does mental health and dealing with trauma and therapy and all of the wonderful important things. Oh my god, it's it's one of those things where I almost sort of don't know where to begin. <laughs> like, I really do love how trauma and, you know, post-traumatic stress is not glazed over in the show. And I love how healthy therapy and communication is endorsed and handled, which is something that I feel like especially for shows about younger characters, get sort of pushed by the wayside a lot. And that's not what happens, you know? These events become incredibly formative in so many ways, and um, I love that they implement the importance of therapy and healthy communication and relying on, you know, your own support network, both for friends, family, or, like, mentors and, you know, professionals you can trust, I I just think it sends some really wonderful, healthy messaging about mental health um, and, like, self-care that we need in in media. And, like, we... I love all of it. I've talked... We've talked many a time before about how every time this show does a therapy scene, we're just like, yay! Healing! Yeah! (laughs) Yay, characters and their emotions! 
It's great, and I think it speaks volumes, too, that um, we see over time that McGann becomes, like, the guidance counselor and gets into therapy, and, you know, probably a lot of that is because she's seen herself how much, you know, it helps and makes a difference, and I, I just really love that. Yeah. That that character growth. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I, one of the things that I love looking at it from, like, the whole show is that in a lot of superhero media and just a lot of genre media in general, fans have for ages been like, these characters need therapy. And so much stuff either doesn't do anything with that or will create something with that. And it's always used to be like, see, look at how if we include therapy in superhero media, being a superhero isn't fun anymore or something like that it's always kind of i feel like a lot of the time right. it's it used as some you sort need of like, trauma to be interesting yeah and it's, well but you can deal with it healthily and yeah you're still you know and so i love how the show presents the these ideas and presents the stuff as like this helps you be better at doing the superhero yeah. thing if you're addressing it and acknowledging it and how the show repeatedly like all the way back in season one, there is the entire episode that is everybody goes to therapy. Yeah. <laughs> and that is wonderful and amazing. But I have loved that over the course of the show, it is dropped in repeatedly in smaller ways throughout the show. Like yeah. in season three, it, there is an offhand reference to like all of the metahuman kids going to like the metahuman center in New Mexico. One of the f- things they mentioned in the intro thing is like, we have metahuman psychiatrists on hand if you guys need therapy over this stuff kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And they have I think it's like the news report or something, you know, yeah. when they're like you can come to the center. It's I'm like, "Oh." And they just have uh Ms. Martian and Black Canary there and they're like, "We have multiple superhero therapists and they're just here. Yeah. And we're not going to dwell on it right now, but they're here if you need them." kind of thing. It's just a matter of fact, yeah. you know, like mental health is a part of this world and people care about it. Yeah. That's fantastic. And the way that this show, we have we have a whole other episode about this because we brought on a wonderful uh, t- uh, mental health care professional who talked about all of this stuff in terms of Young Justice one time. And that's there if people want to find it. But even just smaller things like the fact that like that one, the disordered in season one that is about everybody goes to therapy, does a wonderful job of showing how everyone on that team in response to a traumatic event had different mental health problems yeah. and different solutions for those things. Like, I feel like a lot mm-hmm. of shows, when they do address trauma, just go, everybody has the same trauma right now because everybody did the same thing. And this show was thoughtful about, like, everybody had a different response to this depending on what they they specifically went through. And they're not all easy and they're not all simple. And even acknowledging that's like, Some of them are probably fine after that one conversation with Black Canary, but like they point out that they actively say that Superboy is probably going to have to talk to to Black Canary a couple of times and work through his whole thing because it was more complex and Black Canary even acknowledges she's like, and it comes up, yeah. even, you know, like, because by season three, you know, he's a lot more chill, and the sessions with Black Canary show, and he comments on it a few times, I think. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. This it's show. really great. I also really love how, like, with all of those different trauma responses and needs for how to deal with them, they're all shown to be equally as valid and important as yeah. each other, you know, like... There's no one size fits all, you know, this is how you deal with trauma and we're going to resolve it in 22 minutes, <laughs> you know, Hello Megan style. Um, it's the, the they, all, they all reference this memory at some point throughout future episodes to show that, you know, even when you've healed a lot from a traumatic moment, it like it'll come back like it's never really yeah. better and that's OK. Yeah. And I love it. And how even... Even once they have worked through something or seemingly moved beyond something, it is still formative to how they view things like that is that it like that for Robin is the moment where he goes, huh, I don't want to be Batman. And that just reverberates through the entire show, like even him that being an okay thing to feel and like recognizing and dealing with that feeling still affects his entire trajectory for the rest of the show and Mm -hmm. his fictional life. Um, 
That's okay. This sh- <laughs> spoiler: <laughs> the show is good. The uh, show is good. <laughs> who would have guessed that we here at Whelmed think Young Justice <laughs> is good? Um, I am shocked and surprised. Another thing, sort of too, just that I appreciate is in terms of like mental health and processing things, yeah. they cover a variety of different causes. It gets, you know, it, it hits a lot darker, but um, when Halo thinks that she's dying um, and she sort of spirals, um, you know, having that like really clearly unhealthy bout of drinking and gun shooting with Harper, yeah. um, you know, like, having difficulty coping with the lethal diagnosis is a very difficult, you know, mental trial to go through. Um, Or when Vic is adapting to, you know, life as cyborg now, he even, like, comments on how, uh, like, you know, he's getting therapy and how he's going through the five stages of grief, which is something I can actually kind of attest to in my own experience as somebody who... Uh, like my, I was diagnosed with my first chronic illness at 17, so about his age, and yeah. that's when like I started needing mobility devices and like lots of medications, and like everything changed. And in my experience, you do go through that sort of grief process. And I think it was really wonderful that they touched on that in terms of you know Halo struggling with a diagnosis and with Vic struggling with his, you know, physical changes and new accessibility needs, because that's really what it boils down to. And that really, I I loved seeing that from also just, you know, a mental health and just chronic illness representation standpoint, because that is something that I don't think I've ever seen, really, ever, now that I think about it. (laughs) If somebody knows another, you know, property that sort of handles something like that, I would love to see it. Yeah. (laughs) Please tell us. I have like it's the thing where every now and then we have conversations about Young Justice, where everyone involved doesn't want to say Young Justice is the first time that they saw something happen, but then we kind of pause and we're like, no, I can't think of any other one. Yeah, you know, like I feel like it's important to point that out. And if I am wrong, I would gladly like to know because I want to see and support, you know, anything that handles stuff as well or, you know, yeah. like better, which I've never seen. So <laughs> please, if there is something, I want to know. <laughs> and with both of those things, with both uh, Vic and Halo dealing with the, these kind of life changing diagnoses, even though Halo's turns out to not be true and to be right. being lied to by the end of it. I think part of what the show does really well is like their coming to terms with things is based on them being able to communicate and reach out to people. Cause like part yeah. of why Halo struggles so much with that in season three is because the one person that has told her this and who is she's trusting about this tells her not to tell anyone. And right. that's part of what sets her on a self-destructive spiral. Like I feel like if this had been a real thing that happened to Halo and not a lie perpetuated by an evil mad scientist, so to speak, <laughs> if she had been able to just reach out, I don't think we would have seen her have as much of a struggle. Not to say that that struggle is not completely valid, but right. I think the show does a good job of saying that, like, of showing that struggle is not an inevitability. It is a result of a bunch of factors putting pressure on her. The most important one being that she has been cut off from her entire support system. Right. Which is also, unfortunately, something that happens to a lot of people, you know, who are chronically ill or disabled or, you know, get um, a difficult diagnosis. Either they shut themselves off or family and friends intentionally or unintentionally shut them out. And it can be really isolating. And I really like that they approach that and they handle it. And yeah, again, it's just. It felt really good to see this kind of stuff, you know, addressed to representation freaking matters. Yes, it (laughs) does. And so you brought up Cyborg. Yes, I love Cyborg. He's a great character and the show does a really interesting take on him. I think because the show doesn't shy away from how difficult that situation would be. Like, I feel like a lot of Cyborg media, and this is largely because my... My main uh, exposure to cyborg outside of Young Justice is like the older Teen Titans cartoon that because of its tone and style often doesn't deal with like darker Mm -hmm. subjects, occasionally has a has an important special episode and stuff, but largely just 
is like, these are teen superheroes. They're going to be having fun. And that's what it's right. trying to do. And that's fine. But getting to see a, a version of Cyborg who has only just gotten his powers and has only just gotten his cyborgness dealing with what that means and how that changes his life, I think is very is really interesting and really important and impactful for people, as you were saying. Yeah, I know definitely for me it is because, yeah, like I said, you know, I got my first official diagnosis when I was 17. I had been dealing with illness since I was like 12 or so. And I feel like a really interesting and important take with Cyborg is he is an older teen at the time that this happens and his father makes these very major medical choices on his behalf you know without his like consent i know it's an emergency situation and you know there's all sorts of protocols and stuff in place for that but at the same time i do think it's a really important sort of issue of like medical consent and you know uh, minors being able to sort of speak for their own wants and desires um, I love that we get to see him struggle with these big changes and that he, come, he over the course of the show, he begins to come to peace with it in this season. Like, we never even see him, f we see him start to, like, really embrace it by the end, you know, when he takes over, uh, you know, like, the over, was it Overlord computer? Mm -hmm. And, yeah, like, that's a really great empowering moment where he, you know, sort of, like, finds himself and we see him start to experiment with his own prosthetics and, like, what he can do. And I love seeing that growth, but I also really love that they show that he's got, you know, this... It's a really big change. Like, I can't speak to the change of, you know, undergoing an accident and needing to get, pro like, prosthetics or anything. Like, the closest I have is I'm a mobility aid user, I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user, I use uh, crutches and canes. Um, pretty much if I leave my house, I, I need a wheelchair. Um, so, making adaptations to that is scary when you're a kid and, like, a teenager. And watching Vic struggle with that, it, like, it spoke to me a lot now because I could see a lot of, you know, 17-year-old Sam sort of railing against my parents who were trying to help, you know? They're like, we've got to, like, get you, like, you know, take these medications that, you know, maybe make you feel like junk, but, you know, it, like, helps other things. And, you know, I don't know. It's just, like, that battle of, like, you know, what your parents want for you, what's good for you, what you want, and, like, adapting to all of these huge changes. I'm, like, having a hard time really communicating it clearly, I feel, because there's so much there, and it just, I don't know, I, I see myself a lot in Cyborg, and in his development and struggling, and I, I appreciate it so much. Like, they don't, they don't shy away from how hard that is. Yeah. And I think a lot of shows do, you know, like somebody has an accident, maybe they have like, you know, like a rock bottom, and we see that too with Cyborg, where he's battling accepting himself. But we also get to genuinely see the process of him working it, working through it, and I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really good. Cyborg has a really interesting and powerful arc over season three. He really does. Just dealing with everything, and even the little things with like, I think the the choice for how they designed Cyborg for Young Justice is so interesting and looks. So, like, I remember seeing, uh, I think it was a couple of comic artists discussing it on uh, when the when Cyborg first showed up in season three about how, like, so many comic incarnations of Cyborg and even on screen adaptations of Cyborg, like, make him look like a robot <laughs> kind mm -hmm. of thing that is a little bit human, but mostly robot. Uh, and that, like, puts a level of distance between like what actually happened to him and what he actually is and what it looks like in a superhero world whereas young justice designed everything with cyborgs cybernetics to look more like modern prosthetics and that mm -hmm. to me feels like such like is acknowledging very clearly of like no cyborg has prosthetics and that's what those are he is not just part of a human in a robot body he is a person with prosthetics that just right. because they can also turn into laser cannons does not mean that that's not what they are and i think that's just even just that detail in the way of the design i think is i of course can can't speak 
on this because it's not something I have, but I feel like that would be very important to someone to see that. Right? Yeah. Like, I, I can certainly, again, you know, imagine I'm not um, a pros- – again, I'm not of a course, prosthetics of user, so I can imagine how – like, I'm definitely appreciative to know that the designers were trying to to take that approach. And I would absolutely love to, you know, hear what some prosthetic users think about Cyborg's design because I, you know, love them from my own yeah. viewpoints. Um, but I'm sure there are people, you know, who I definitely I know there are people who identify with him in their own ways. And I would just like those are discussions I would love to have. But it's so important when designers take the time to design disability and like mobility aids well like one thing that i do really wish or hope that we get to see at some point is a more cool bat chair for oracle because i was so excited to see her um like i loved her intro i love that her intro you know in uh, oracle edition babs like (laughs) flipping a dick over her shoulder is a wonderful, you know, introduction. And I love that over the course of the show, they actually don't address, like, what happens. She gets to just exist and be disabled in a wheelchair and live her life. And I really appreciate that. But Barbara Gordon would have a really cool souped up bat chair. (laughs) And, you know, she's shown in this very simple, basic, like medical transport chair. And I know she's, she's got to have something cooler that she'd be, you know, wheeling or hovering around with her her house. (laughs) That's if if I could make any request, I want a cool bat chair. (laughs) I just that whole idea just makes me think of how one of the few other examples I can think of of like characters uh, who use a wheelchair in like superhero media is I love there is a tabletop RPG show called Callisto Six that we have oh, mentioned. Oh, Sam Delev. Yes, with Sam Delev. Uh, and <laughs> yes, just, I'm familiar. <laughs> yes, I'm so glad. I love when people have heard about this. And just the I feel like that was one of my first introductions as an adult to seeing a character who was just in a wheelchair and was both casually in a wheelchair and also very because they are played by a person who is in a wheelchair very thoughtfully represented because Sam Sam Delev has those experiences and yeah. every description of uh of that of Lacey's wheelchair in that show is so thoughtful and so wonderful and it has so many fun uh cyberpunk like details to it and stuff that are all there because that player and th- who invented this character clearly was like this is what mm. I'd want a, s- a wheelchair in the future to look like and I'm like that's so amazing yeah um to be perfectly honest um Sam Delev uh was also like one of the first people I became familiar with in Teach RPG Actual Plays, who played their own disabilities into their characters, and it yeah. made me go, oh my god, like, I want to do that more too. Um, I would honestly sort of began playing games as a form of escapism and, like, wanting to distance myself, and the more I've seen more disabled and chronically ill folks, especially people like Sam, um, who is at Tchaikovsky on Twitter, people should yes. follow them. They're fantastic. Them. I feel like if I'm so gushing fun. about them, I need to like point people in their direction. And you know that like since then, I've I've been making a point actually. This whole 2021, 20, I declared that all of the characters I create this year for actual plays are have my chronic illness and or disabilities. That's awesome. So, you know, like my mask PC in the incidentals is an ambulatory wheelchair user who also has fairy wings and flies in hero mode instead of wheeling because it's easier. And <laughs> I want to see, you know, like that kind of representation is so cool yeah. to get to just sort of casually be like, yeah, I'm rolling down the hallway at school. Like, you know, it, it's I don't know. It's fantastic. And it matters. Yeah. Seeing that stuff matters. <laughs> Clearly, because we have this entire episode now where I'm just gushing about how much it meant to me to see this in a different property and, like, how seeing, you know, Sam do this in Callisto 6 is, like, you know, it's shaped what I've been doing for the last, like, two years in a lot of ways. (laughs) It's like that, the whole thing with tabletop RPGs and figuring out what to, what 
like what to put it what whether to use it for escapism or not kind of thing like I've, yeah I've talked about it before with my uh, Protean City Comics character Highwire has my little thing that's my bit of representation that I search for in every media property I can find it in that she has food allergies because that's oh, something yeah. I deal with in my real life and that is something that gets overlooked made fun of yeah. or used as a PSA in everything it is ever featured in mm -hmm. uh, and so when I was creating that character Pretty in City Comics I feel like has always been so wonderful about being like we want to create a superhero world that anyone could see themselves in yeah. so when I came on I was like hey can I do this thing and they're like of course of course you can Go yeah for it. run with it and I love hearing that that's been your experience too with that kind of thing of being of using tabletop RPGs, especially actual plays, especially something that has an audience to be like, mm -hmm. I want to create the representation that I always wanted to see kind of thing. I feel like it's yeah. the feeling for a lot of actual play uh, players and GMs of just like, what's the thing that's not in any media that matters to me specifically? <laughs> right? I was like, I want to make a disabled superhero. Somebody let me play one. And, yeah. you know, James was like, oh, hey, <laughs> what are you up to? <laughs> and I'm like, ooh. Yeah. Can I have a pink wheelchair? He was like, heck yes. Yes. And speaking of, I wanted to get back to Barbara for a little bit. Yes. Because she is so amazing. and is so I important. love her. The, you brought up the fact that, like, Barbara in season three as Oracle is just allowed to exist. Uh, yeah. And that is so wonderful. Like, I love, I was rewatching some clips and things. And I love that there is never a moment where the fact that Barbara is in a wheelchair now is used as some sort of like shock value or something. Mm -hmm. Like going into season three and knowing that she was going to be Oracle, people weren't sure what like are we going is is she gonna be in a wheel is she not? And then of course we get the scene where she is and it's treated very casually. It's treated yeah. as just this is Barbara's life. Uh, and Dick Grayson is totally used to it and is totally fine with it. <laughs> yeah, it's... I love it. Yeah, I love it. There's, you know, a scene towards the end where they're sitting on like a couch together watching TV and you just, you know, see her chair in the background. I'm like, yeah, that's that's freaking life. You know, I mean, I've got like a walker and a cane right out of you. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, the the camera here. I mean, I I think it's really important to just let us exist, not to use us for, you know, freaking trauma points and stuff you know yeah. like um which is very much how the oracle is handled in the comics in terms of you know becoming disabled so i'm actually yeah. glad in a lot of ways that they glossed over that because yeah. i've got i've got words for a different podcast <laughs> conversation about the original oracle yeah because um, the i love that the time skips between seasons even though i am a person who has often said that like the time skips frustrate me because I want to see everything. We're skipping over right? stuff. Let oh, me see. I love them so much. I and it's it goes back to like watching the first episode of season two one week after season one ended. Mm -hmm. I think all of it stems from my, my <laughs> the emotional moment of what do you mean it's five years later when I <laughs> Wait, was, what? A, was a a small tween being shocked and appalled that we like missed prom and graduation and I have never fully gotten over that emotional <laughs> moment, but. The one thing that I do love about the time skips is that that time skip between season two and season three allows us to completely skip over why Barbara is in a wheelchair because I would totally believe this show would do something other than the killing joke. Right. But because uh, this show has been very good about finding new and interesting ways to present these characters without while still like holding true to the core of these characters. But the killing joke is kind of an awful way that we got to Oracle. Yep. <laughs> but Oracle is so amazing yeah. and is so important to people that I love that this show was able to find a way to go, we are not going to make you sit through whatever that was to get to something that is a an amazing bit of representation and an amazing narrative element of Barbara's overall story. And right. just that, that simple fact of the time skip just going, she's here now. Uh, right. Like, That's great. That's all I need. I never She's need here, you to tell me how we got here. Living her life in a chair and still able to do hero stuff, you know? Yeah. Like, she's still out doing things in the field in her own way, and I I love that. One thing that I would, I would love to see at some yeah. point is more heroes who are just disabled from birth or illnesses or conditions that have nothing to do with heroing. <laughs> you know, like that would be really nice at some point. 
you know, I want, like, you know, more heroes with, like, arthritis or <laughs> congenital limb differences or, you know, things like that. And oh that God. would be so cool. But in the interim, just getting to see Oracle live her best darn life and still kicking Dick's butt. Um, like, being able to flip Nightwing over her shoulder like it's nothing while using, you know, VR goggles is just, yeah. Barbara is just... Bar- get it, Babs. <laughs> Top tier. Uh, yeah. She's ready to go. I and love like, her. Even, I was, I've just been, I was rewatched bits and pieces to, like, remind myself of things for this, for this conversation. And one of the things I noticed rewatching some of Oracle's appearances is, like, even little things of, like, her apartment is clearly, de- we only see it in a couple of wide shots, but mm-hmm. her apartment is clearly designed to be wheelchair accessible. Yes, absolutely. That the thought that was put into, like, hi, we're going to actually show that, like, we're going to make this work. All of the counters are lower and there is space to move a chair in and out of these spaces. I'm like, that is great. That is such a small thing that right? I feel like a lot of stuff would overlook or not acknowledge or just go, we're just not going to show this. Yeah, we get like that quick shot of like her kitchen and I'm like, I want that island. You know? <laughs> like, I'm like, I want that. <laughs> yes. Um, oh man, and you know freaking Bruce Wayne is hooking her up with the best accessible stuff, which is another reason I would really love to see her in a sweet souped up wheelchair. Because yes. you know what? In real life, accessibility is, you know, a major cost barrier for a lot of people, you know? Like, I'm stuck in an off the rack, so to speak, wheelchair that's not very comfortable for me because I can't get, like, a cool custom one that I know Babs can get. So, like, Babs, <laughs> live your best life, treat yourself. You know, get like a memory foam cushion, some cool, like, I don't know, battering grappling hooks out of the wheels. <laughs> Let's yes. go. I I'm... want a spinning bat signal on <laughs> the, the side of the wheel and little click clacks. <laughs> yes, I would. I, yes. I, I know in some comic appearances have given her different wheelchair designs over the years. So yeah. I would love them to do one that's like customized and that is her. I especially hope because that. like. We have seen her in the Batcave in season three. The Batcave yeah! is accessible. Uh- exactly. Like, you know, oh, man, you, you know Batman had Alfred build some freaking ramps or something. <laughs> just immediately. It's just, we're going to overhaul the whole situation. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna which make is it work. fantastic. Uh-huh. You know what? I bet it also means that my new headcanon, actually, now that we're saying this, it means all of Wayne Enterprises is also extremely accessible because yes. this would be something at, you know, Bruce Wayne's, like, forefront of his mind, which is important. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All very good things. Be an abled ally, Bruce Wayne. Thank you. <laughs> Especially because young Justice Bruce Wayne is is very good and we like him. He's a good dad and he cares about his kids. I and he know. would do whatever it took to, to help everybody. <laughs> I love it because I even again, looping back to the whole mental health thing is he's clearly very concerned about Dick's mental health state. And yes. seeing Bruce Wayne let his walls, you know, down in a, a manner, <laughs> as much as we see him let his walls yes. down at all, uh, to sort of, you know, bond with this kid going through a trauma is like, I really appreciated getting to see that that side of, of Bats. I absolutely agree, especially because I feel like so many versions of Batman over the years lean into the idea of like, well, only somebody who's never dealt with any of their trauma would do these things and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Or like Batman's a loner and he doesn't care about anybody because that's aesthetic. And I'm just like, Batman is clearly a a person who cares about other people deeply, who has adopted like five people over the years. Like this- (laughs) He's just bad at it. (laughs) Yeah, and also, and it's also the thing of like, he doesn't need to be bad at it. In my right. brain, Batman being bad at, <laughs> at caring about people does not need to be part of his character. So I appreciate that the show that the show when dealing with that in a show that has made yeah. it clear that therapy for superheroes exists has shown us a Batman who genuinely and actively cares about and supports the people in his life. And I'm like, I love that. <laughs> More of this in other media. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like Young Justice Batman has found a way to still embrace a lot of that, like, you know, 80s, 90s Batman grimdark that we all love, but also has gotten really grating over the last, like, couple decades. (laughs) And they retain a lot of that angst, but with 
without the headache. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yes, absolutely. It's it's good. Young Justice Batman is a good dad, and that's all I ask. <laughs> yeah, that's all I want for my for my Batmans. I just want a good bat dad. Good bat dad and happy uh, Caldern win. That's all, that's all that I want. <laughs> people being happy and yes it, i know it's a lot to ask from this show but still it's all i ever <laughs> ask the next issue will be a happy one <laughs> the matter of Caribbean city comics yeah one more thing about oracle before we probably wrap yes. up that i wanted to bring up was one thing that i loved uh re-watching things and seeing stuff was the fact that Oracle as this is I'm trying to find a way to say this that makes sense. So if this doesn't make sense, feel free to cut me off at any point. Yeah. But seeing Oracle being a wheelchair user and also seeing her be a love interest in a superhero media mm-hmm. feels like a lot. Like I feel like it I cannot is. like the number of like and Oracle is of course far more than a love interest and is her own character in her own right, but I mean just structurally for this conversation for a minute. Right. I there are so few, if any, disabled love interests in genre media specifically, but also just in media in general. Mm-hmm. And I think it is so important showing that Barbara, like that, th- that even being in a wheelchair does not change the fact that like her and Dick Grayson have been having this relationship for a while. We have seen through like the dying yes. comics and stuff that it has not changed anything, and she is still like an active romantic person and seen as a quote unquote, this is like viable romantic option, like is a weird way to say that, but you know what I mean? It's how, it's how we're treated, you know, in so much media is like disabled, disabled folks are not treated as, you know, viable romantic options. And, you know, I hate that word, but I could not think of another word to like explain what I meant. It's how we're treated. And like, you know, you were saying like, oh, you know, even the fact that she has, such a well-developed character aside, you know, she's more than that. But it's like, we can't divorce that from that because the fact that she's disabled and a love interest and as an entire character with agency and things going on outside of that relationship, you know, like that, that doesn't happen, you know, and it's wonderful to see a happy, happy, healthy relationship, you know, where um, especially it can definitely, you know, be hard to go through a relationship change, um, you know, knowing that uh, she had an accident at some point in this time off and she and Dick, you know, are together and happy and healthy because that's what happens in real life is, you know, couples who freaking love each other don't see each other as burdens and they will stay together and be happy. And I'm so glad we get to see that happen (laughs) because that never happens in media. And... It really, it means so much. Yeah, especially in light of the time frame of when when, when we are recording. There have, um, just in the real world, been a slew of very ableist news um, postings. Um, you know, specifically one that cited, you know, just like content warning ableism ahead. Um, that cited how, like, you know, it, it interviewed only the caretakers of um, disabled folks and framed everything as, you know, people becoming disabled being a burden on their loved ones who are who become caregivers and things like that. And seeing, you know, knowing that we've got freaking, you know, a Batgirl and Nightwing <laughs> hanging out, having a happy, healthy relationship post vague killing joke arc is really it means a lot. And like that's an experience that I'm getting to have reliving like now even after seeing it. Which sort of goes to show, I think, how powerful and important this kind of representation is. Because it's like, you know, that had meant a world to me when I saw it the first time, you know, like two months ago. But, like, rewatching a few episodes over the last week to get ready to talk about it now. Yeah. Like, these moments, they hit me so much harder now. And, you know, it's like, even these things that I thought I'd already been excited about and processed about seeing in the show that... It just keeps building and it just goes to show like how powerful and important this kind of stuff is and how much it can mean. So I don't know. I love it. And thank you. Thank you, Young Justice. It's so good. And there's just so it's so good. 
Sorry, I, I was just I love like hearing word vomiting joy. everywhere. No, you're fine. I love hearing <laughs> people's joy about whatever their specific thing is that they are always joyful to find in media. It is, it fills my heart with joy to hear people being that joyful. So I'm actually, I know we mentioned one thing about this already, but I'm curious, what would you love to see in season four in terms of all this? What's something that would fill you with even more joy if we got to see? Oh my uh, goodness. Um, other than souped up Barbara Gordon Oracle bat wheelchair. Barbara Gordon. Oh, field bads though. Field Oracle would be fantastic yes. to see. <laughs> Combat um, wheelchair. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, like, give give me, give me bat chair. But otherwise, I guess, yeah, something that I would love to see is, would be what I had touched on earlier, to yes. see more disability rep from folks who are disabled from something completely unrelated to being a hero. Yeah. You know, whether it's, you know, they were born with a congenital limb difference or, you know, more, more deaf or hard of hearing or, or blind characters or heroes who became, you know, wheelchair users or something even later in life due to other reasons, you know, like like me. It didn't happen until my teens. And seeing people deal with that and still be able to go out and be heroes would be really cool. And that would be a totally different kind of representation, I think, that, you know, I haven't really <laughs> seen happen. The closest we get is with Vic Stone and, you know, becoming Cyborg. Yeah. But again, it happens through the course of an accident. So, you know, for me, at least, like, I, I would just love to see something happen over the course of regular living life besides comic book hijinks. <laughs> <laughs> but then I want the hijinks to be awesome, you know, afterwards. Yeah, aside course, from that. <laughs> always. Because we have, I, it like, it slipped my mind when I was initially writing these notes and stuff, but like. The fact that Artemis's mom is also in a wheelchair. Oh, yeah. We also have Paula Croc on the, this. Like when I was writing this up, my brain always like defaults to like the main teenage characters when coming up with examples for anything. And then I'm like, oh, wait, <laughs> right. Also. Oh, no, I've definitely thought about Huntress. Because um, yeah. actually when I was like talking about the differences in wheelchairs, I'm like, yeah. yeah, she has the kind of wheelchair I would have because, you know, she they clearly don't have the same sort of funds as uh, as a bat child. Yeah. Um, and, like, it makes sense that, you know, she's in more of, like, a, a store-bought medical transport chair. And in her case, too, you know, she's another person who was disabled through injury, in this case through villainous acts. And the only line we get at all in the series about somebody, besides Vic sort of struggling to deal with his changes, about somebody wishing they didn't have a disability is when yeah. Huntress says something to Artemis about, you know, like, you don't want to become like me. And I'm not going to lie, when I first heard that, I was like, ooh, ouch. But at the same time, that's one of those instances where it's like, well, yeah, they've got, you know, a, it happens through her sort of, like, life choices as a villain, and we get enough disabled representation otherwise that, like, having one character you know, who went through a traumatic experience wanting to, you know, undo it and, you know, wish something different. Like, that's also really wonderful and important to see. Yeah. Um, and I love that aspect of Huntress getting to be shown. And it's even, it's 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 touched on a bit in the comics, too, in the tie-in comics, too, that, like, part of it with Paula is her accident, like, preceded her getting arrested and being mm -hmm. in jail for a while. So she was dealing with coming to terms with having a yeah. disability while in prison, which right? I can't and speak separated to, from your family. You know what I mean? Like, I can't imagine. Like, yeah, I, of course, can't imagine. But I would assume that's not uh, that's not the best environment to try right. and figure all of that out versus seeing like I can assume that Barbara over the course of the two year mm -hmm. time skip, whenever that happened, had a wonderful support system and had. Uh, wonderful medical care at her disposal and yeah. thus has a much healthier relationship with with her chair and right. with her disability than Paula might or at least yeah. initially did. Exactly. And that's also something so important to like call yeah. attention to is that difference in terms of, you know, financial, you know, racial classist privilege yeah. is, you know, like, yeah, Barbara's got better access to better support, you know, better accessibility, better medical. So, you know, yeah, she's still out there kicking butt and, you know, like, making robots and solving crime and, 
you know, I can totally see Hunter being like, I'm going to retire, focus on my family, and, you know, try yeah. to cope with what's happened. And I appreciate that, like, a lot. That's not something that, you know, it, it's not called out directly in the show, but it it's shown and disabled folks watching it can see it, you know? And yeah. that's that matters. Representation matters. <laughs> it does. It's- like the the nutshell of this episode is representation <laughs> matters. <laughs> and it sounds I know it sounds so cliched at this point in the world, but it's true and we should say it. Exactly. So Sam, thank you so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower. Uh where can people find you here on Earth Prime? All right. Um so you can find me on Twitter at the Sam Wisest. Uh, you can also follow the accounts that I stream with, uh, Chromatic Chimera and No Initiative, or you can find me playing games with Protean City Comics in the Incidentals. It's very fun. We love, we love, who, surprise of all surprises here on Whelmed, we enjoy teen superhero media. So what? definitely, I yes. can't imagine. <laughs> it's, a, we need it's a huge surprise. High Wire and Sprite to uh, to meet at some point now. That's yes. what this means. <laughs> it's gotta well, happen. We'll get we'll get into in contact with some of those Protean City editors and be like, yeah. hey. <laughs> James. Hey, hey, James. Oh, I, I, I'm always just like, I just want to play with everybody's characters. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> Thank you to everyone listening at home for spending some time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, uh, CrashingTheMode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a review, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. because we have to look a little harder to find those ones and you letting us know just makes our job easier. If you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. (laughs) You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.